or just roll with it? Home party. Say Home welcome, party. everybody. Let's say, say welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome everybody. everybody. Welcome, everybody. Back. Hey, welcome, everybody. Oh, you sound great, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going through a tunnel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait. Welcome, everybody. Uh, to yet another episode of Poem Party. Guys, it's been a while. Yeah, we've been, been surviving and digging deeper. And yeah, trying to mm-hmm. find the surface again. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Chris is fine. Chris is fine. I'm, I'm pretty okay myself. I'm doing a lot. I'm doing pretty okay. Mm-hmm. Right now. I went through a, a dip, I think, but back at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I uh, escaped to Florida. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I've lost all everything. My face, uh, visual representation. He's pretty become, much everything. He, he's reduced to a series of letters, a, a minor signal of what he used to be. Just zeros and up. ones. Yeah. Just a, a thin veil of meaning draped over us a, a few characters. Uh, I'm glad Galway's dead and doesn't have to see this, what we've become. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> although, although he'd probably get a kick out of it. it I think he'd be bemused by, yeah. by the moment. No, let's be realistic. He'd be like, Fergus. Help me log on to my email. <laughs> <laughs> Just what's my password? <laughs> glasses on, very close to the. <laughs> yeah. It uh, says I'm not muted on the Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> I think I muted myself. <laughs> Boy, they really suck. <laughs> <laughs> what is all this? I think you call this a reading. Ah, there's taking his shirt off. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, 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 please. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know for no particular reason. We stopped for a while. I think it was just getting, it was just a weird, would you say that times have been weird? Mm. No, they've been pretty much the way they have been our entire lives. Yeah. Well, if like there was a, it's my own fault. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think for me, I mean, it's not like this is a, an assignment like school, but to be expected to do anything <laughs> outside of what I already am felt insurmountable. Yeah, yeah. It, like w- we recorded one that we didn't. I don't think we actually put out. And even, yeah, I don't think like because it, yeah. because I just like I was like I can't do that right now (laughs) i I can't go about you know editing video and audio uh, but i feel keep that one for us yeah yeah well one in the bank for us but uh i feel like i feel like in may the world was kind of out of whack but now it's august and it wasn't normal feels like the new normal yeah it's all well it's all better now (laughs) yeah. <laughs> uh those you know it's amazing what a few months will do <laughs> the, the russian vaccine yeah thank you so much for the russian vaccine dr putin thank you <laughs> i've lost my pinkies but i never needed them anyway yeah i've turned into a monster from resident evil yeah from the waist down uh chris is an octopus you know? <laughs> like i spend more time in the bath <laughs> which is nice <laughs> you, you choke a couple of people to death so yeah so out of, but, yeah before we realized theory. that it was like helpful to put some live fish in the bath mm. you know for you to grab with your lower half and consume with your lower half you don't have to buy new pens now you just got your own your own that's great yeah oh i turned 30 that's a oh that's a new thing yeah i turned i turned 30 did hey, you Tyler, as well? When is yeah. when was your birthday? It was it's in the past couple of days, right? Yeah, yeah. But you don't have a Facebook, so don't have a Facebook. So, so. we all forgot. Yeah. <laughs> so you all forgot. 
<laughs> Everybody forgot. I, w- I would like to go on record by saying I did not forget. He did not forget. Oh, man. Okay, well, yeah, I'm sorry, well, Tyler. In fact, for Alex, then. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, we did something. Wow. Yeah, left my apartment, even. Um, well, that's all right. You guys can... I'll make it up to you uh, on my 30th birthday. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. We forgot yours, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're even. <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely forgot yours. Did I? You didn't I mean, come to my party. I'm just kidding. I didn't have one because we live in a hellscape. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me just come on up to Boston. I'm not there ever, anymore, though. Ever. Even well, before. Like, let me yeah. just come up to Boston, no pandemic. Uh, <sighs> but, yeah, you're in Ohio now? I am. I'm with my parents. Ohio. It's nice. The return of the prodigal son. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, little stopover in Niagara Falls. In Viagra Falls. <laughs> It was very uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, it was very eerie and. See, Alice, yum. One of the most disturbing experiences uh, I think I've ever had. Disturbing. And, yeah, and for no other reason than, like, Niagara is one of those places that, when the people aren't there, you can tell how sad it is. Oh. Like with the empty streets and closed down shops, it feels like the apocalypse. Yeah. No, the falls were still like crowded, but nobody was going to play in like the arcade. The casino was closed down. The rainforest cafe was like boarded up. Uh, There's a rainforest cafe. There are two. Niagara. There are two rainforest cafes. I I think I have. I have formative. Childhood experiences at the Rainforest Cafe in a mall, but not in Niagara, New York. No, not in Niagara. No, in Orange County, California. Yeah, I I went to one in Chicago, but I think I was too old. I think my younger sister was of age, but like, I was just on the other side of the cusp, and I was like, "What? This isn't a restaurant. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is, a ba- is this? it's like a bad Disney ride." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I've ever been to one of these, and I'm not even sure I know what you're talking about. Well, it's just a restaurant that serves like American food, and there's a like a plaster frog, and the soundtrack has like didgeridoos and goes. <laughs> okay, so at get, the one I at the one I grew up going to, there were like full on animatronic. Yeah, like, I seem to remember gorillas. Anime. Yeah. Did, I assume there's one in Disney that I went to. I think that's where my memory is. But yeah, it felt like. But Niagara, it was just. I mean, it was like interesting. I'll never forget it for my entire life. But it was really haunted. Ugh. Wait, I've, did you go to Rainforest Cafe in Niagara this time? No, it was closed. Oh, every everything was closed. Right, right. They don't do to go. <laughs> there's no, there's no street side, like on street dining. <laughs> that, that's like getting a, a curbside from a strip club. <laughs> Great steaks at this place. <laughs> All of the plausible deniability of the restaurant as a restaurant goes out the window when you can't eat in person. Well, there, there was a basketball player, Lou Williams, for the Clippers. Who I got know. Trouble for going <laughs> yeah. to a strip club. But he. Like he had a, if I'm not mistaken, he had a uh, uh, item on the menu named after him, right? Yeah, he said oh, I was yeah. honestly just there because I liked the food. <laughs> well, but everybody tells me that Atlanta is different. That in Atlanta, you you and your friends would go out and sit away from the performers and just eat because they also have good restaurants. Yeah, but for the yeah. sake of our argument, why would you go to the well, Rainforest Cafe for carryout? Right. There, would, uh, growing up in uh, outside of Tampa, there's a strip club along the highway that uh, 
we'd always pass by, I think it was called personalities. Um, <laughs> and they, there would be on some evening, like, like weekend evening, or it must be weekday, whatever evenings, there'd be a guy, there'd be a huge, like a really big guy outside grilling, like in front of the entrance and, uh, like, like you'd see the, like a little bit of smoke and, you know, you'd like see it and turn your head and you, as you're driving past and you'd see this big guy flipping steaks outside of the entrance. <laughs> and it just seemed like such a, like a, like, Oh, I'm just going like, like what, what honey? I, he's, he's grilling. It's food. I'm, <laughs> I'm just getting a steak. It's great steaks. You know Tony. He makes fantastic steaks. <laughs> if you can find a place with dry rub as good as Tony's, then, then we'll go there. But until that day, I'm going to the strip club. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if Galway Canal ever went to the strip club. Maybe in the 80s. I don't know. Yeah, after he got divorced. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And before he married his second wife. Nice little interlude. I could, see, I could see him and Dennis Johnson going to a strip club. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello, madam. My name is Galway Canal. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis you Johnson probably... became really, really religious. Though, okay. Yeah, he was he was a uh, born again Catholic. Yeah, and, which is and had a committed marriage. For, but then again, that doesn't stop. You know, sometimes that's your path to the strip club. <laughs> I love my. Drug addict who got clean and became Catholic. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Dennis Johnson. I'm thinking about Franz Wright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Those are some. some yep. Getting some structure in there. Just like <laughs> we need some. We need thousands of years of structure. That's what we, <laughs> we need. You know, a whole decrepit empire of structure <laughs> here to make sure I don't go back. Yeah. Wish. And write, write some good poems. Galway. You may recognize me as the former poet laureate of the state of Vermont. <laughs> but tonight I'm just Galway. <laughs> <laughs> Please call me Galway. Have a good show. The, I wonder if Galway and Bernie Sanders ever hung out. Good question. Could, good question. Good I, possibility, right? There's a picture of him. Uh, if you do a quick Google search, uh, by image, you can see him reading in a coffee shop that's clearly in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no question that it's a Vermont coffee shop. And I can imagine it's Burlington, right? Yeah. There's, they would cross paths. Like Bernie. Coat factory? Hmm? Like the coat factory? Yeah. They're in a Burlington coat factory. <laughs> you know, I was trying and, on dead man's coats. Yeah. <laughs> coat <factory. laughs> each, each one a dead man's coat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just Bertie's separating. He's going through separating the coats very wide, putting them over here and over here. Yeah. yeah. The coat hey, he's, uh, he's, the he splits. Two finds Galway Canal on the other side. <laughs> sorry, terribly sorry. To I I haven't even heard his voice in in months now. I can't even yeah. replicate it right now. Who's He's a Delaware poet? Out. No, well, Delaware? Delaware, the poet laureate of Delaware. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be the laureate. Um, I'm just trying to think who would have an interaction with Joe Biden. <laughs> great imagery coming out of whatever that conversation is i mean like, our, our old pal claire sibley yeah claire. claire sibley well i don't i mean hopefully <laughs> joe biden and claire were not <laughs> <laughs> running in the same circle yeah <laughs> well joe yeah joe's a little, a little busy <laughs> we're yeah. not actually maybe not so busy Depends. Hey. Hey, we're not trying to get political here. Look, I like I like in that ad when Joe Biden said, "My God, because my dad drive a car." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, could my dad drive a car? 
<laughs> I mean, now I, I saw Twitter reactions that could have, like, like boomers responding like, like, no, we, that actually means something to us. Yeah, and yeah. like, okay, all right, okay. Yeah. I believe, you know, yeah. Yeah, for, for you know, <laughs> people for whom a, a Nissan Maxima isn't what you think of sure. when you think of a car. Sure. Yeah. You know. Like, <laughs> yeah. I also, in that same video ad, he almost, he like careens past the camera. <laughs> and it feels like he's going to hit you. <laughs> oh, uh, I like it. It See, is indeed. I, you know, yeah. it, like I, I think that one of the last episodes we did i i feel like i talked about that it's it's become endearing to me yes but i don't know we'll see it it'll be i don't even know what to what to say right now every time he talks it's like beat poetry it's yeah look man look man this is a wild (laughs) time man things are crazy man (laughs) you're digging for muskrats yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man find me digging for muskrats and all the right we're all the right wrong oh, that was the I name should, of neil, neil, Cass, neil yeah. cassidy's manuscript that <sighs> didn't get published was digging for muskrats <laughs> i shouldn't have said that i'm sorry <laughs> go ahead i love it when he does that honestly <laughs> i i that is that i find that endearing because i that i would feel that way if I was a politician. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the same way that I like I felt a lot of empathy for Jeb Bush in the oh yeah. In the elections. Like I I, I just I feel like I see myself up there. Like not not politically. Like I don't like ideologically I we're probably not very compatible. You're just both in Florida. We're just a couple of Florida guys, you know, who you know, oh, somebody put me in front of a camera. Here, let me let me try and wing it. Uh, uh, I thought it was funny, right? Uh, oh, well. Oh, well. You know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, yeah I, f- I feel like flustered Joe Biden every day of my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. And I don't begrudge him. Yeah. It is fun, though. It is fun to begrudge him. But back to, back to Galway. So, I don't think we actually said it. We're talking about Galway Canal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I thought it was implied. We we said his name early on, so I assume it's and kind so of they in there. Initiated all the dead man's coats stuff and the right. book of nightmares. <laughs> book yeah, of right. nightmares. <laughs> we are reading. We read the book of nightmares as well. I read a little bit around the collected. Walked around the collected a little bit. But uh, suggested we read the book of nightmares. To me, it was it was like the it was the first book of poetry I actually like got into. I think technically the first one I read was a Billy Collins book. Great start. Um, but uh, right after that, I I was I had a friend whose dad gave me. Uh, like a first edition copy of the book of nightmares uh, wow. with like some other poems stapled in the back. Oh, like, that's the top. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. It was great. And this was like, you know, this was like first semester in college kind of stuff. I hadn't really been very exposed to poetry before that, you know, just like making new friends on campus, new, new city. It's the fall and read the book of nightmares and really uh put me in a in a place of like positive darkness yeah yeah you know like generative like like the like positivity in recognition of mortality you know kind of generative space like really tapped into that uh it's like there there's something different to me about this book compared to what I see in a lot of his other work. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. I mean, just in in the sense that I, in, he starts off a very, you know, typical poet of the times in terms of like, 
you know, leaning towards formalisms, rhyming, you know, sure. all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then it seems like the sixties kind of crack them open. Well, Billy clubs too. Yep. Yep. There's a picture of him bleeding at what appears to be a protest or something like that. Yeah. I remember reading him. He, he talked about, forgive me, I'm going to misquote and partially mischaracterize what he was saying, but basically <laughs> like participating in, in, like, good civil, faith. in civil rights, uh, protests and marches in the South, like he being from Providence and being a Northerner, like knew about the situation in the South, but also like couldn't believe it until he saw it with his own eyes, I believe mm -hmm. is sort of the gist of what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And so he threw himself uh, head first into that movement. Yeah. I think he was living in France. And then when the civil rights movement became a part of the news, I think he wanted to get involved with it. And yeah, I think he joined, I think it was called the Congress of Racial Equality. Yeah, of course. And yeah, and did a, um, like spent half a year down in Georgia, or no, Louisiana, um, helping to get black voters registered and to integrate, integrate racial equality into business into local businesses. Yeah, and didn't, I think his translation, I mean, in line with what you were saying with him in France, I think his translations of Francois Villon mm -hmm. are 1965, something like that. It's like six years before this. Uh, <laughs> Chris. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm just doing something real quick. I know. I know. Your picture came up. <laughs> but Vion is from 65. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just corroborating evidence for <laughs> what Alex was saying. Also, there's a mention of Roland in the Book of Nightmares, the French epic. Uh, probably middle French epic, uh, mm -hmm. the song of Roland. But um, yeah, it's, I, like I get to say, I mean, Body Rags was right before this book and that's definitely, you know, cracking in towards this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it like Book of Nightmares is definitely a real formal opening up and much more incantatory I guess, you know, there's, I mean, it's a book length poem, which typically a book length poem, I, I, you know, I, I get the sense usually that something like that implies more of an outpouring, you know, more of a, yeah, and I, don't, I, I don't think he did it. I, I don't think he had another book length poem and didn't write poems like he did in the book of nightmares at all after he published yeah. it. Well, I yeah. see it, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to notice this, but I see it almost as an homage to the Duino elegies. Because yeah. There's uh -huh. kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, there's a lot of differences, obviously, but having the um, a Umbrilka. similar kind of uh, uh, incantatory um, kind of big philosophical approach um that's broken up through kind of these uh chapters almost yeah the the line and the form is so so this is one of those books that makes you feel like like at once that you can write poetry and also like how could i ever do it because it just seems so natural the line seems like they're not they don't seem to me intuitive, but I never doubt him for a second, like when he does it. So it, it is very like natural in the sense that it feel, he feels like an animal, like they feel like animal breaks. Yeah. There are a few clumsy line breaks in there, yeah, but, yeah. but for the most I mean, part, I, I really like the way it, it works. Yeah. I mean, there, there, I, you, I also think of Whitman 
you know, mm-hmm. there's a kind of wit, wit manic line break and stanzaic shape to, to to how it unravels. And I think that's connected, Chris, to like you're saying, like there's a kind of natural or almost like embodied, uh, like embodied line break, I- intuitive, but also like very, very physical. Yeah, and, and that it's visceral too, like in, in the way that, I mean, it, it's almost like it's, it, to a certain extent, the content mirrors that as well. I mean, it's very brutal. Yeah. You know, it's very, it's very grotesque in technically speaking, like, like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like very bodily, very, you know, like, like that's a heads being cut off heads being fucking pulled off, you know, just like really in there, you know, blood, oh, it's getting blood, blood, blood well, and guts. like a song of myself. I feel like it, it's sort of suggesting that like all things are present, you know, that um, it's a consciousness mm-hmm. that is, it's not just mine, it's yours. Mm-hmm. And um, although my children, mine as in Galway's children and sort of autobiography are more present than, um, yeah. than you know, I can lay claim to. <laughs> but, uh, <Yeah. laughs> well, it's also like, I was thinking of like, there's the sections in, in song of myself and i think it's drum taps as well where whitman is visiting the wounded Mm -hmm. in the civil war and he's like almost like nursing them back to health in the poem Mm -hmm. there's kind of like that aspect in this this book but there's also like a almost like a deep messaging against war like a prophet there's almost like a propaganda in 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 the book of nightmares of like Mm -hmm. you know like this is the brutality and the cruelty of war. <laughs> Thus, it shouldn't happen. You know, that's like, that, that was the kind of subtext of a lot of mm-hmm. how I was reading it. Well, an, anti, an anti-Vietnam book at a time when, uh, like, politics was out of a lot of poetry. Yeah. And well, I mean, and I'm th- I also thought of Merwin a lot. Like his trajectory mm-hmm. as a poet is very similar to Merwin. And I they were classmates, a- right? Yeah. 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 Um, and he lived in France just a few years after um, Merwin had moved to France and was engaged in a translation project. Although I don't think to the extent that Merwin was, but um, I think this came out just a couple of years after the life. Yeah, this yeah. is 71. Yeah. 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 And he was working on it through at least 69, right? Because Chris, you were saying you the read shoes. Yeah, it's you read an earlier the, version. Yeah, which I think he edited to its uh to its improvement uh for the book length project. Yeah, but it was called The Shoes. It just didn't have the same flow, partially probably because it wasn't didn't have the same sort of purpose as part of a larger movement Mm -hmm. yeah i guess part of the reason i was looking to this book is it it has a sense of dealing with a deeply confusing and brutal moment and you know finding the depths of of what of like what the, of this like subjective humanity, like like the brutality within one's own humanity and just with like kind of inherent in life and the world, but then also, you know, where are the edges of what's wrong as well? Yeah. And, and within that generating a, a sort of like a map to find oneself. That's like, it's like, it's like a, 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 a a map or, or like a, a set of like a, a way of generating meaning at a time where you find yourself in an ultimately confused and, and like depraved situation. And I, imperiled I, even. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, you know, sort of aiming it at his kids at, at least rhetorically as like, you know, this is your way. Like, I, I have been trying to get out of what has for 
me in society been a great trauma. Yeah. Right. And well, yeah. you too will find yourself at some point in a place of, of utter darkness. Yeah. I was right. reading under the Maud moon, the first section, mm -hmm. the first chapter out loud to somebody. And they were like, what? anybody, anybody you could find <laughs> somebody in my house. But I, uh, they, they came away not knowing if Maud was alive or dead, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it was his, the. I remember the first time I read this book, I didn't realize he was talking about his daughter. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I think and his and his son. There's moments where it's not just his daughter. And it's Fergus. Yeah. Sancho Fergus. Sancho Fergus. <laughs> but I was, I was, there's also like a deeply religious thread. To this book almost like a criticism of religion uh and I, you know i think the 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 idea of engaging religious themes the way he does is, for me was also like a question of like freedom like a, a a notion of freedom and um you know how how one is supposed to carve out a kind of spiritual lives for themselves when they're in this world of evil and and cruelty you know, like the like the idea of the salvation of salvation comes up, and there's also like him. I think there's the poem, "The Shoes of Wandering," where he's literally going through the Salvation Army looking for shoes and thinking about wearing the shoes of dead army men. Yeah, uh, and, and I like like I, I know that this is something that I personally think about and and often come to come back to, but it. it there's a sense that I get in it of like along the lines of what you're saying. It's like, it, it's looking for like a pre or post Christian, you know, like a uh, way of being spiritual with the objects of the world. You know, it's like yeah. this, it's like this shamanic process of like finding the spiritual items and getting the spirits out of the items and yeah and and pulling you know meaning and practice out of your wolf bone knife yeah <laughs> well, those, those moments like the the shoes wandering and the the notion of mapping one's way by finding it in wandering is really mm -hmm. like a basho type approach to things mm -hmm. where where you are you're arriving at your life with every step you take um, and you're, you're finding meaning in the, in the materials of the world that you are, you happen to come across because you are footloose. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's also like a, a deeply Buddhist notion <laughs> as well. You know, the kind of embodied practice and the, the mysticism that happens and the kind of accountability, you know, that happens when you spend time or wander in your body as opposed to, you know, in uh, another world or like in an afterlife or something, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and also you could say some Native American, if not spirituality, yeah. the orientation yeah. with your life and the, in the earth, you know. Yeah, um, there was a poem, there was a poem, I think it was the, the blue, I don't know. I'm not going to Winiata. Winiata. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was deeply like had its tentacles going into a kind of like Native American commentary on like the, the cr cruelty done to Native Americans in the 19th century. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that was a song written, it was a parlor song. The title is taken from a, a parlor song written in the 19th century um and it's spoken in the voice of an indian woman like l lamenting um her her lover hmm. interesting yeah but it was hard I, I didn't really know what to do with like there are these moments where you can't really make connections in a book you know and then there are moments that are mapped out more logically uh, but then there are other moments where the, the meaning extends into places that can be connected to everything else. Yeah, I, 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 I find that 
the more often the rather than outlining a specific logic, it's much more viscerally oriented. It's much more like oriented towards like sub, you know, God, I don't, I don't quite have the right word for, I'm sure there's like a technical word for it, but it's, it's like sublimating it or, or making it like, like seeking a transcendent sense of meaning rather than a logic of like a followable ethics or something like that. It's like, it's almost like given this set of circumstances, Mm -hmm. you know, you, this is how you feel. Yeah. I found like the, I found that there was like a deep ethic through line throughout. Mm -hmm. Like not, I, I, I totally, yeah, I'm totally on board with what you're saying. And I, you know, I was also thinking that there's a deep ethic throughout the book, um, but it is organized in a way that isn't pinned down. Like it seems to be organized in a kind of um, image, like in a in in a, in a way that's not tangible, but mm-hmm. you you can access it in some way. Tyler, can I ask you a question about yeah. your experience with this? How did it affect your writing? Did you ever did you ever copy Galway Canal or did you internalize the lessons or was it something sort of parallel? Yeah, I definitely think I like there reading through this, there were uh things that I realized that I had digested and written. Um, like rewritten essentially. Like I had digest like there was a couple lines where it was like, oh, I I stole that line, but I didn't know that, you know, like I I stole that line, you know, eight years later. Yeah. And just because it was like, it wrote itself that deeply in my consciousness. Yeah. Like there, I I would say that like this book, like, like one of the reasons why I, you know, asked that we go over this book in some way is, is that I really wanted to go back through it because, you know, I felt like I was going through a period of, stagnation in terms of you know I, I was kind of i mean with all the stuff going on around COVID, i was like had a lot to do at work <laughs> you know yeah like had a lot of stuff that i had to do in order to not have everything fall apart and you know so i was coming away from i was you know i felt like i was being peeled away from uh the mode of being that i prefer to inhabit <laughs> sure <laughs> and this book for me is like almost it's it's like part of who i am at this point right like like, and i and you know i i wasn't so like like i thought that was probably the case and then like rereading it i was like well this is my consciousness you know like (laughs) like i i read it at such a formative time i was like 18 or 19 i was like 19 years old you know just becoming like you know my first experiences away from home and this this process really of of like relating to the world became surprisingly fundamental to how i interpret the world i think mhm yeah and and it's been great <laughs> rereading through it it's yeah. been super exciting and you know like today i had a great time today just sitting outside in like misty rain uh on on the roof here you know with a view of like queens out like queens in brooklyn and you know i had already read through most of it i was just like could barely read up there because i was just sort of you know in the moment of it and just thinking through a bunch of stuff. It's, yeah. It's been very helpful for me. Yeah. But I mean, so that's my experience, <laughs> you know, well, no, my, but my history and experience of it, but like, are you reading it like Chris or anybody like, are you reading it for the first time? You know, is this your first experience with it? And this is my first experience with this book. You know, uh, Canal was probably one of the first poets I read uh in that you know my first poetry classes that i took with the contemporary meaning 20th century poets um 
like they all signed would have signed anthologies. So I got about three anthologies uh, of 20th century poets and Cannell is in every one of them. Mm-hmm. And so between them, you know, I read the bear five times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, that, it was really formative. I don't know what I got out of it. I mean, certainly something, cause I liked them and I remembered the poems. Um, but I, I just am trying to think in my process. I think that, you know, the, the unusual lines I was suspicious of because I always felt like I was an imposter and mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I understood how it was done. It felt like a emperor's new clothes kind of, um, when you do that, when you try and do that, you mean, or, or when time, you read it and, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like, well, he must, there must be something to it that I don't understand, and therefore I won't try it. But it was very, but I was like, but I like the way that it works, um, Mm -hmm. but it intimidated me. But I had not read the, I had not uh, read this book prior Mm -hmm. to this. I had a, I had a teacher in college who suggested the Book of Nightmares, especially, and I think I read you know, a couple of the sections and especially in college, like I was so drawn to the form of it. Um, The idea that you could sort of, you didn't have to get this crystalline poem of, of 20 lines, you know, every single time you write a poem, right. um, You can kind of make a mess of a book. Yeah. Not not that this is a mess, but I think I related to it as a, as a kind of diffuse. Yeah. uh, form and uh it, like in the same way that you might write a prose book you, you kind of give yourself the space to um to kind of make your mess mm-hmm. um and then you you tighten it as you go uh i felt like um poetry could be that sort of thing based off of this book also just like his his consciousness of uh, of living in a um a time of war from the perspective of a non combatant um, was interesting to me. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not aware totally of his military service, if there was any, but I can imagine he didn't fight in Vietnam. No, I, I think, think he, so. he did. Yeah. I think he did two years in the Navy though. Oh. Right. I don't know why yeah. that sounds right. During the, yeah. He was, he would serve during the second world war or at the end of the second world war in the Navy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 1927. So he probably would have been 18 oh, at yeah. the close of the war. Uh, yeah, right. two years in the Navy. But but writing about, you know, the trauma of war on a culture um, from the point of view of someone who is not traumatized in the way that uh, a soldier that comes back from battle writes about his experience. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that was something that I was always looking for in pieces of work. Because I also love, you know, I love the, the you know, ladder as well. The either right. a war correspondent or a, a veteran speaking about that. I love that perspective in literature, but also as somebody who who has never wanted to be uh, in harm's way in that sense, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and doesn't want for. Uh, others to have to go through that in most cases. Um, uh, I think the the book that you could protest against uh, against the the apparatus that creates something like the Vietnam War um, mm-hmm. through a a book of poems was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, you know, because I was reading a lot of Ginsburg. And there, with Ginsburg's protest poems, there was kind of this essence of him already ha- having been uh, tossed out by the culture, that he, he couldn't have right. been, you know, Joe America if he had wanted to, because he, right. he in some ways, you know, tried his hardest to assimilate. Right. Um, but Galway is somebody who, you know, uh, demographically could have been totally fitting in um if he had wanted to um, yeah and to make that kind of like emotional choice or having the emotional um uh makeup of somebody that is disinclined to participate in the in the machine 
uh, <laughs> is something that I... I don't know. He might have had trouble finding work as an Irishman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows? I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> I, <Yeah. laughs> didn't have a, I, didn't, I doubt that completely. I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Go by Gary Kinsella or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, and Michael, you also asked me to take some pictures from the uh, the Sheffield guzzles yeah. as well. That's my favorite canal is mm -hmm. his, his shorter work. Um, uh, and that poem specifically, the Sheffield gazal, guzzle um, number four, Driving West, mm -hmm. was a poem that I found when I was in college or so. And uh is living inside me oh it seems that poem in particular it's like it's like galway cano was like writing to you yeah. in that one it's like yeah. it's like i know what michael's gonna like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, did you talk about his yaya -ya in it <laughs> <laughs> it's i mean it's it's like it it it's a it's a poem that could ostensibly have also been written by sam Shepard. yeah you know it like it, it could be in motel chronicles yeah you know, it's, it's like a it's very, uh, very shepherd of canal. Is it an imperfect thirst? Where, which? Yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Which? It's a section in imperfect thirst. The the epic, epigraph, epigraph. The poem. Epigraph. Epigraph. Yeah. Epigraph. <laughs> epigraph. The the, the, <laughs> the words at the beginning. <laughs> epigraph. Yeah. Epigraph. Okay. The the epigraph at the beginning of Imperfect Thirst is pretty great, I think. Uh, if your eyes are not deceived by the mirage, do not be proud of the sharpness of your understanding. It may be your freedom from this optical illusion is due to the imperfectness of your thirst. Mm. Which is like like I like that a lot of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, of like, Oh, you met you like, like you didn't see, you didn't see the magic. Like you weren't fooled by the magic. Well, that's, it's not that you're, you're so sharp. It's that you didn't want you, you don't want what that is so purely or so deeply that you could see it even if it were there. Right. Who is that? In, who's that epigraph from? Uh, Sorawardi. I don't know. Yeah. Sorowardi. I meant to look up who Sorowardi is, but I don't know. But uh, yeah, I was going to look up the Sheffield Guzzles. Yeah, I would say for me, the Imperfect Thirst and Strong Lose Your Hold is, are my two favorites. And, Your favorite books? Yeah, and book, books that I've returned to probably like weekly or monthly in the last four years. Mm -hmm. Really? That, that frequently? Yeah. yeah I, ha I always have the collected on my desk. And, I had no uh, idea. Yeah. No, I like, I, I worked at the McDowell colony right after grad school and I hadn't read Galway Canal until I started working in the, at the McDowell colony. And this was probably like six months before I was fired or not giving a shit, but, uh, <laughs> for but, criminally uh, not giving a shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why but, I arrested um, for not giving a shit. <laughs> <laughs> but VJ, VJ Shashardi was, the Shardy was, uh, doing, giving like, this was like probably two years after Galway Canal passed away. And, uh, BJ Shardy was doing a like memorial for him at the office in New York and like the director of McDowell was going to speak and um, like a bunch of writers were going to speak on his behalf and I had to work the event and it ended up being like a really wonderful event and I still had not read any of Gal Galway Canal um, but then the next day my the director of McDowell McDowell Colony went on vacation and I came to the office early and went into her office and she had a bunch
bunch of copies of the collected. And so I just took one <laughs> off the shelf and put it in my bag. And then that day I like went to Washington Square Park after work. It and fell like into your up. bag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it said Charles Wright on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I started reading through some of the poems, and one of the first poems I read was "Strong in Strong is Your Hold." In Strong is Your Hold, and it's a poem about him being in Vogue's library, which is NYU's library, imagining and like empathizing with people who have committed suicide in that library. And he's sitting in Washington Square Park, thinking about the the, the gate that they ended up building it in the Bob's library because people were committing suicide in it. Yeah. Um, and they also like was at a time where like right before my dad passed away, he was writing poems about his father who had Parkinson's disease um, and who like he was writing about dementia in a way that was fun and like playful um, and also bringing in like high literary references and then like low like low lyricism at the same time um, yeah so it was just like all it all happened for me in the right moment and it I, I don't I don't resemble him in any way as a poet but emotionally he's very dear to me and his poems especially strong as your hold and a perfect thirst are very close. And I, I consider him probably one of the best poets in the last 60 to 70 years and one of the most well-read poets for sure. Mm -hmm. That's funny. I mean, I had no idea that you had that connection, which is beautiful by the way, but mm -hmm. um, I, I do not hear that in your work at all. No, which yeah, is okay. I mean, it's not there. I, I mean, I just, I go to him more for like, it's an imaginary mm -hmm. space in his yeah. poems that I go to, not a formal space. Yeah, yeah. There, I don't see anything formally, but there is a spirit. I can like sense a, you know, there's a, some quality in there, like some sort of like place of origin or something. Of, yeah. You know. And yet, I I felt like when I was reading this, I don't think that our styles are similar, but I, when I was reading this, I felt inspired constantly. I think your styles are similar, especially the later mm -hmm. poems. There's like a romantic consciousness. Going through a tunnel. Uh, <laughs> well, we lost Alex. I, right? I can't help but imagine it. Like I could, I'm imagining a, the same thing happening to him physically as is happening to his voice. <laughs> <laughs> like if, <laughs> just like like Beetlejuice things happening to his face. Are you with us, buddy? Alex? Fine. Uh, <laughs> Are you, you you broke up there for uh, 20 for, seconds. For a good I'm, minute. Yeah, I'm trying to let it pass. Okay. Okay. I think it's best. Uh, okay. Well, no, I was just saying I do find a lot of similarities especially there's a, you know, in Gal Galway Canel's work, there's a romantic consciousness, you know, and there's like a high fiction that pops in. Well, I, I do do that. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a, there's a kind of... So I think what happens is that, Alex, whenever, you, what's happening is you're starting to embarrass Chris, and that's causing, <laughs> it's causing so much, like... Uh, enter, like some sort of energy output. That's <laughs> he's he's turning into Christopher Blackman. <laughs> you know, there's something beautiful about Vermont. I, I have to imagine that was helpful for him. Like the landscape of Vermont, it's very much like New Hampshire, Alex. For your yeah, no, I know, yeah. But there is just something about it. It's like, it's hard to explain because it's not like Alaska or like Maine. And yet it does feel like a different way of living. Yeah. I, yeah, reading, reading this, I was feeling very, very wistful for 
a situation where I didn't have to do anything except be in the woods. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, like like where all I had to do was like, you know, just stare at things. Like like I'm very like I really uh, miss that. I I had that like as I was a student for a long time. <laughs> you know yeah. who didn't have to work exceedingly much because of that I had the the privilege of largely not working for a long period of time i really miss having the ability to spend a good day staring out a window or something yeah. like that this book it's funny uh i got it on tuesday and i read it and then I uh, decided to take a walk. I'm at my parents' house. This is the neighborhood where I grew up. And uh, my we were walking on a wooded area. Um, my fiance and I were walking on a wooded area uh, where I used to just hike and explore the woods when I was a kid. And it's also the street where um, these people moved in and they have a Cane Corso dog that attacked my sister. <laughs> uh, pretty ghastly. Apparently uh-huh. the dog is still alive. And there was this weird emotion, having read, you know, the first uh, Under the Maud Moon by that point, walking through and, uh, like, being in this wooded area where, as a child, I explored and also, like, feeling this imminent danger because we were in the, on the street where this dog lived. Yeah. Uh, and just this idea, the, the, the mixed feelings of, of wonder, but also, like, me thinking like I may have to kill this dog if I that, that <laughs> if feels like across me. <laughs> I feel like I have that dream all the time. <laughs> I don't even know the house. I just knew it was on the street, and I felt like I understood that. Like I don't know. Mm-hmm. There, there was a primal. There was wonder, and there was a a primal component to the whole thing. Yeah, highly recommend if you. Uh, if you're looking for an immersive experience, I recommend that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I am thinking about walking through my neighborhood at night or even just being in my, like my childhood home, you know, as an adult and just having echoes of childhood fear come up mm-hmm. at certain moments of like just remembering the kind of irrational fear that you'd have as a child growing up. Like I, I don't, I never experienced that right now, like living in New York. I just don't have any of the antecedents of that around me. And so like, I never think about something being in, in a room where the door is closed. Right. Like I, there's no sense of like my roommate's room is closed and I come home at night. There's no sense in me of like, Oh, is there some somebody or something in there? Yeah. You know, none of that. But there will be times, like at at when I'm like back home and my parents are asleep or something like that, and the house is off, and I'll look down a hallway, and there will be a, like a literally a fear of a velociraptor <laughs> from Jurassic Park that will come into my head, and it's like when like like how many de- like it's been decades <laughs> yeah, i get the same same sort of thing yeah, yeah. I, well there's a mirror in the in my bedroom upstairs my pa- like where i my parents house and i had my phone to light the way because it was dark and then i saw the reflection of my phone in the mirror and had a moment of visceral like terror and you know like i i was talking to two friends last night about this exactly this thing, it's like one of the most frightening things in the world is encountering people when you do not expect them. Oh, like absolutely. It's your back to caveman experience. Yes. yes. Like, like you're thrown into like, oh, I'm not, <laughs> I, either you're in my territory or I'm outside of my territory. And yeah. in any case, that is a deadly situation. <laughs> and every one of my friends had a story of, of like, Harold, one friend, his dad uh, was like a contractor and they were was working on this house that nobody lived in. There was no furniture. And his parents would drag him on weekends while they worked. And in the basement of this house, there was a, a condom wrapper, massage oil, and the hand towel that his mother had kept upstairs. 
was in the, the downstairs. Uh, Horrifying. And Horrifying. Just the, even not even running into them, but seeing evidence of it is so artifact of oh. them is so creepy. I would be. Um, oh, I similar to that. I there was one time where I was so I was in Tallahassee. I and it was the summer, and I w- it, all of my roommates were out of town. They had been out of town, um, and they were going to be out of town for like a month. So I was living in the house by myself and I was, uh, you know, like I, for some reason I had it in my head that it was fine for me to leave all the doors unlocked at all times, just because that's how things should be. And so that's just how I'm (laughs) going to be, you know, which is not really the way you should interact with the world, (laughs) but that's how I was. (laughs) And I came back from work one time uh, I was working as a busboy at Carabas Italian Grill. Uh, shout out Carabas, chicken marsala, great calamari. Um, and I got back, and it was nighttime. And I went to open the door, and the door was locked. And I w- had not been locking the doors, and so the fact that the door was locked was abs like I just like a cold you know cold went through me <laughs> you know and i like was thinking like somebody okay somebody was here somebody like yeah. or somebody heard me pull up and was like "Ooh, shit i'm gonna lock the door <laughs> like yeah. somebody might be on the other side of this door right now and so i like i took like 10 minutes to go around the house i was going so slowly and quietly and i i went into the house all the lights were off in the house and I, the back door was unlocked, which even further made me think like, okay, somebody's here, responded to me doing this. You know, and I, I went in the back door, like, again, this, it's taking me like five minutes to open a door, kind of right. level of, of complete adrenaline and fear. Go into the house and I get to the kitchen and there's a chair overturned in the living room. Like somebody had, had like, it, and I, I went again, like minutes long into the kitchen and got like two knives. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm, I'm like, I, I went, yeah, I'm just like going through the house and all the, all the doors are closed. Like all the doors, there's, this is a five bedroom house. Every door is closed and there's a toppled chair in the middle of the hallway like somebody threw a chair down the hallway and I like, I've never been more scared in my life I think, of just the possibility of opening one of those doors and there's somebody there. Yeah, it's like the Friday, the 13th video game for the Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> it was basically that same thing. You're like you oh. open a door and eventually you're going to run into Jason. Right. We, oh God. And what ended up being the case was that, my roommates came through and to check the mail <laughs> and in the process trashed the house <laughs> for no discernible reason. <laughs> they just came through and were like, ah! you know, like, where's the mail? <laughs> in the dark. And then, in the dark <laughs> and then left before I got there and didn't think to say like, Hey, we're coming through. <laughs> in college, one of uh, one of our friends broke into our house uh, in the early hours of the morning when everybody was asleep and rearranged the furniture in the living room. And they kept it as a secret for like six months. <laughs> so we would we would talk about oh. we would talk about like, man, I still can't believe that three months ago the Somebody furniture got in. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. it's deeply unsettling. It's like when you're also exploring the woods and you come across a campsite. It is like deeply caveman y. Yeah. Like, there's a part of your brain that goes, it's like there's a very deep switch yeah. that turns on, you know, and which links back to all the brutality of war and all that kind of stuff that we were talking about before and what 
you know, I think there's a lot of that in the book of nightmares. I find, I mean, that, I find it hard to, to discuss this. I don't, cause I don't feel like I can see all of it. I love it. You mm-hmm. know, I enjoy it, but I just don't know if I have the words to describe it. Yeah. I, I feel like there's historic. What? The book, the, oh. I like, Break it down yeah. to com- component parts that I could even articulate. Like, yeah. I think that I, I get the feeling like it, this is something that holds up extremely well on its own, and yet at the moment there was contemporary context that is no longer a part of how we think about that moment, right? How we think about the end of of the civil rights. Or like uh, the like the end of '69 into like civil rights movement into the end of the Vietnam War. That's what I'm trying to articulate. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like there's I think there's a lot of images and moments that would have been uh, relevant to somebody at the time that are probably touched in some way by this, or there's some sort of character that that is, is brought into this of the moment that even though this, like the, the spirit of like the ghost that inhabited that is gone, what's left behind is still completely, you know, its own thing that we can enjoy and, and love, but there's probably some little stuff. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's what the sixties and the early seventies and all that, like we, we have mythologized them. Mm-hmm. You know, to a degree that um, sometimes, like even even watching a Ken Burns documentary I, about Vietnam, it's exactly what I was thinking about. You you are so stunned into um, into the, like the timeline of it. You know, and even lately, I've just been thinking about all those assassinations. Oh, like like just how many people were killed that way that were of so uh, vital a piece of the framework of the times you know oh. imagine if just all of all of those people just how they just vanished it, from from existence it's such an unbelievably traumatic moment like yeah, all yeah. of it, and and it's become it, yeah it's become this like 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 there's like you think of summer of love and like three video clips of the vietnam war yeah, yeah. And, it ain't me. Uh, I ain't no fortunate son playing in the background. Yeah. yeah, and and like I I can't suggest Ken Burns's Vietnam War enough, you know. But yeah. oh my God, you how know, like, complicated LBJ was. How complicated, uh, you know, international relations were while while domestic shit was so fucked up. And Not I to just, mention, we're still in that moment we're still yeah, in the, yeah. in the, that era uh you know everything after world war ii we're we're doing that right now well, the, the, to me like the the ken burns series of you know documentary series like the main takeaway i have from all those is none of this has ended yeah right like none of this is over in any way you know or like like there are still so many echoes that are, we're blind to, you know, that we've sort of excised from our typical parlance about what's going on that is really important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, like, I mean, he really captures, at least in the Civil War and the Vietnam ones, like it, it teaches you what America is in a way. You know, mm-hmm. like, what, like when you are part of this thing that like you, this train that you can't stop and so much stimulating cultural change is happening within this kind of like all the time forever within america (laughs) (laughs) like there was never a moment where like where america was quiet and (laughs) i think i think with with the book of nightmares the one thing that i read it as and i read through all of galway canal's work is that you know family and childhood is really the first institution and that you know that war and politics and all these other kind of 
social social institutions emerge out of you know formative like your family right your, your fam the nuclear family is the first institution and the kind of aggressions and tenderness and the love of that happens in family extends outward mm -hmm, you know sure. into these other kind of social institutions i mean you know the, the half of the book of nightmares is about the kind of primitive childlike encounters he has with his daughter you know and then the other half is all of these more political politically charged experiences um everything from you know cruelty and and you know like kind of michael you were saying like international politics to domestic politics and you know the kind of um like the the cruel history of america and you know our relationship with geography and all of that like um yeah i mean I, that's why i think that he's engaged and committed to caring for the people closest to him as a way of engaging with the larger world right and it's like you know, go ahead like um I, get, I swear i read the whole book of course but the first one the first poem under the mod moon is i think the one that i really stepped like came away with like a <laughs> deep deep um connection to and uh, the, he, you know, the images of the speaker <clears throat> building a fire in the rain for Maud, like, even though I know this is a, a futile gesture, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this if there's a chance for you, because yeah. you want this and sort of is like the, the resignation, but also, yeah. Yeah. And like, like I, you're going to be here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to be here too. And 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 you know <clears throat> going through some of this and so and and maybe i won't be there then so like this has to you know yeah. i have to do this i have to get this going yeah the and, sense of significance of being you know a parent with parenting someone like with your your fully formed consciousness for better or worse and like how it's not it's not simply that uh, you have power over this little person. It's that you are in some ways like just before them on the, the curve of the earth. Yes. And that's in uh, the, mm. his, one of his most famous poems after making love, we hear footsteps that yeah. ends with the startlingly muscled body. The idea that this boy will become a man. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, and echoed also in here when he's saying, "My boy had such great shoulders that he got stuck." <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Trump. <laughs> it's like a Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen him. You should have seen the shoulders on him. <laughs> Eric was like a giraffe. He got, he got stuck. <laughs> and also the also the idea that you know like. Hmm. Change, the change and the hope you have for a better world begins with how you treat the people closest to you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you are <laughs> if you are a parent, you are responsible for your children because you want the, not only your children be successful or whatever, but because you want them to change the world or to be a part of the changing world. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, like you were, we were talking earlier about, um, well, I don't know if we were talking about it, but I was thinking about, you know, that so much of religion, whether it's secular or organized, is, you know, to foresee the results of, like, human aspirations, right? Like, humans have desires, and they want to, you know, better the world, they want to better themselves, um, you know, and, and part of that is, um, I mean, for... Galway Canal, part of that is, you know, the responsibility and caring for the people you love. Yeah. Did you say right? that like, to foresee what people desire? Is that what I heard? Yeah. 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 I like that. Sorry. No, no, I just wanted to, no, no, it, it was clear. I, I just wasn't sure if that was the word you used. And I like that word yeah. for that. Well, I mean, I think like the reason, I think for him, religion is contradictory you know, in that, like, religion induces fear on a social level, on a larger social level, 
right? Like the idea of salvation or the idea of the eternal creates fear, right? Um, but also at the same time, it gives hope for human aspiration as it relates to the future, right? So I think at once the book of nightmares is critiquing organized religion, but it's also looking to distill what is useful in having some kind of spiritual life or some kind of freedom, right? Yeah. And the and that that spiritual life is connected to the way we care for each other and the way we care for the people we love, right? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's carried through throughout all of his work and something that I love about his entire body of, of work is, you know, the the amount of attention he gives to his daily life and takes himself out of the picture at the same time. Yeah. Right? He's, if, 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 sorry. If, if you're no, building yeah. strong, if you're helping your children become strong people, you are, it's kind of like that, you know, teach a man a fish sort of thing. Mm -hmm. like yep. when, teach when, a man a fish and, <laughs> and he is a fish. Yeah. <laughs> teach a man to fish. Um, it's like, you know, he has purportedly a strong person himself in the way he thinks about his own family. Uh, you are letting somebody, not, you know, have the tools to take care of themselves so that they can live in relationship to their uh, sense of wonder and doubt and criticism of, of society. And in turn, those people are then going to relate to other people who... Um, will be afforded the same courtesies and supports of, you know, somebody who was cared for in that way and have that, um, you know, representation to refer to, you know, like you, you're not building somebody who is at such a, such a loss for warmth and care that they're going to need more from another person than that person could provide. It might be an overly uh, psychological lens, but, um, no, I mean, hey. I think, I think in terms of tradition, like we get this idea of like the American or the the Western idea of spiritual life in this way comes, and I was thinking a lot about this as I was reading the Book of Nightmares. It comes from like I'm thinking of like Kierkegaard and Fear and Trembling, you mm -hmm. know, and like this kind of push towards a secular way of living and caring and being tender and recognizing fragility, you know, all of this, all of these kinds of things. Um, and I think for him, that's in family life and being a parent. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some part in, in here, I forget which poem it's in, but there's a line that, you know, there's the, the title that is the title of all poems and the text of all love. Mm -hmm. And that, and that title is, tenderness towards existence mm -hmm. yeah and i was like oh yeah like that's a that's a good that's a good title i'm gonna pack that away <laughs> <laughs> pack that away for a poem that says it's after galway can you know like something like that <laughs> there's there's also a line where it's i think it's the wages of dying is love yeah mm -hmm. which is also one of those like yeah you know, I'll, I'll try to live my entire life to write a line like that. Oh, yeah. Another thing I love about him is how I was thinking about this because I was thinking about how shitty Ken Burns' hair is. <laughs> <laughs> and was, Ken Burns looks like he's wearing a Beatles wig. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, but Galway Canal, I, I, Respect to him because he, like me, is a sweaty hair poet. The man, is a, every photo he can He is a keep greasy hair haired man. <laughs> <laughs> he can't keep it, you know. I mean, I don't know. He's, he's, there are a lot of great photos of him. I like to look at photos of poets. Yeah. Uh, in front of Poet's House uh, with some grunts in the background holding the Poet's House <laughs> banner behind him. <laughs> like he's the king of. <laughs> <Poetry>. <laughs> on one of the bridge walks yeah it's just but i just you know when i see him in his hair he probably did it like i do every day and then it just sort of sags and then it looks like a hedgehog i get that <laughs> well he's he's 
it's endearing, I think, in all the the pictures of him. Yeah. You know, he looks like he can't help that. <laughs> he, let me tell you from my experience, it's not helpable. Yeah. No. He died in that year when we lost like so many great poets. Yeah. Who was it? And uh, Strand. Mark Strand. Yeah. yeah. Um, Seamus Haney, it was 2014, yeah. right? Or was yeah. that 2013? No, I think it was, I would think he was in there as well. Yeah. Well, it would be 2016? No, 2014. You're right, 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And then soon after that, like Dennis Johnson and Sam Shepard. God, who else um, in 2014? There's a whole slew of them that time. 2012, yeah. 13 people were passing. It's been, I mean, there a couple of generations are, are passing now. Uh, you know, it just feels yeah. so strange when, like, uh, Bridget Peggy and Kelly just all of a sudden is passed, you know. I don't know. <laughs> C.D. Wright, you know. Yeah. But, oh, that was, yeah, that was another thing. This book reminded me a lot of Frank Stanford, actually. Mm-hmm. Like there's there's a way I I was wondering while I was reading it, you know, to what extent I, I can't quite I I feel like Frank's most of Frank Stanford's stuff was like five years after this or so mm-hmm. right like later seventies into eighties yeah yeah that's probably right so they wouldn't be they probably didn't interact but he's probably exposed to this. When Frank Stanford came to New York to go to the movies. To go to the movies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why, they didn't have a theater in Arkansas then? <laughs> that, was he, that was what he said. He was like, I just went to New York to go to the movies. Yeah, I went to New York for a month to go to the movies or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I got, I like, I, when I was reading this, it was making me think about where Frank Stanford could have gone, you know, like, like I got a sense of like just watching the way that, that this is this, you know, like I was saying this opening thing that then develops into, you know, a more measured poetry, you know, like Frank Stanford was on the really extreme end of cracked open (laughs) and, (laughs) and a lot flowing out. You know, and what would that look like if it were, you know, matured? If it had an extra 40 years on it? I Yeah, it's almost like, you know, I wonder that myself, you know, because he was part of that time where, you know, American poets were like sort of going through stages, you know. Like what, what, did, what would he have done if he had, you know, kind of shed the more uh, hyperbolic surrealism or, you know, kind of over the top, image making uh, but but also it's kind of like i don't know that's that's who that guy but, was yeah, yeah yeah it's like it's like it's it almost is it's besides the point because it's like so much happened in such a short time that was so productive and strange and interesting and he was, he had so much that was just tied to the the land that he was from and the people that he grew up around and lived amongst you know yeah um I don't mean to be critical of you guys because I understand exactly what you're saying. But I also have a visceral reaction when people are like, you know, I love that. I wonder what else he would have done. It's no, like, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I know. And I, I know I'm that's only, not what you're saying. But. I'm only saying it in the context of like seeing something in front of me that reminds me of yeah. it. You know, because, because yeah, it, I mean, it could have been just as easy for him to like, go on into obscurity for the next 40 years doing literally nothing, you know, or. I think in some ways, you know, C.D. Wright, like took the Frank Stanford, you know, example and really ran with it in a lot of interesting ways, you know. In, yeah. in a lot of ways, I really preferred C.D. Wright. Yeah. Um, not that you have to take one. <laughs> I was, this week I was reading Shell Cross. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Which is great. I hadn't really, I like read it when I first got it, but for some reason didn't remember a lot of it and then reread it. And yeah, it's like 
a jewelry box. It's like a treasure trove. Yeah. There's so much good stuff it, in it. But I've never read I've never read any of Frank Stanford. I can send you a little sampler. Battlefield where the moon says hello. Uh, <laughs> Battlefield where the moon says hi. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't start with Battlefield where the moon says I love you. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, CD right one of these times coming up. Yeah, yeah. Because I need to go deeper into. I love CD right so much. Into her stuff. It'll be CD right and CK Williams. <laughs> yeah. The and, and Charles and Charles Wright. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and then and Franz and Jane. Yeah. <laughs> All the white poets. <laughs>